Welcome back. We go to the subject of Syria now, where the deadly crackdown is spilling into neighboring countries. At least three people were killed in northern Lebanon today after a mortar fire flew across the Syrian border. This comes one day after Canada joins its allies in increasing sanctions against Assad's deadly regime. But reports today from a Turkish news agency show Assad remains undeterred. Our Chris Sims is following the developments, and she joins us now live from our parliamentary bureau in Ottawa. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Well, a, a situation obviously that is, is going downhill at best at this point. Uh, what do you have for us today? Well, really, it's just increased talk. And I think a lot of people are feeling this way when they're just, you know, sitting on their on their chairs watching these sort of news stories unfold and when they're really, you know, laymen uh, looking at foreign affairs issues. What's happened right now is that there is a so-called Friends of Syria meeting. That means friends of the people who are fighting against the Assad regime. And that happened in Paris. Out of that, uh, John Barrett, our foreign affairs minister, and Hillary Clinton, his counterpart, the Secretary of State for the United States of America, both came out and condemned both China and Russia. The reason they're doing that is, of course, because they're the two staunchest allies of Syria and the Assad regime. And that's, I think, what the big difference is here between a lot of other countries. So we get a lot of email of people asking, why don't they just do what they did in Libya? Or why don't they just do you know, what they did you know, in the former Yugoslavia many years back? And the answer to that is because of politics, because of geopolitical politics. We've got Russia backing them, China backing them. Both of them are mega powers, China especially with its trade and Russia, well, because it's Russia and it's got such an amazing history uh, confronting the West. Also, we have to keep in mind that the, you know, it's a G7 country. It can't be taken lightly. So when they turn around and said, we're going to back them all the time, and Russia did just recently at the UN, they used their veto saying they won't condemn what Assad is doing. They're really in uh, between a rock and a hard place. They can say all they want that they're increasing sanctions. Really, sanctions are as tough as you can possibly make them between Canada and the United States, and rather between Canada and Syria, and between the United States and Syria. There's not much more to be done at this point, except I think a lot of people are now hoping for it to crack from within, that something happens within Syria to tip the balance and have them overthrow their own government without foreign intervention. Yeah, Chris, and for those people that say, why don't we do what we did in Libya? The fact of the matter is, yes, they have uh, what we're calling democratic elections in Libya today. But in certain parts of that country, especially around the area of Benghazi, we have separatist movements in the south yep. of the country. We have uh, people slaughtering each other every day. Our eyes have turned away from Libya. And I think that's a part of the fear with Syria as well, especially since we're getting reports. And, and we've been talking about this for months, but increasing reports of Al Qaeda activity in Syria. How do you deal with that? You're not going to arm the opposition when they are Islamic militants, obviously. No. Oh, and that's exactly what happened in Afghanistan a long, long time ago, people might remember. And it eventually morphed into Al-Qaeda because they were fighting the Soviets. So I think a lot of people are hesitant to, to really overturn so many rocks, so to speak, internationally and cause so many more problems. We all, of course, have to keep in mind that right behind Syria is its big brother, Iran. Uh, they, the two countries share an awful lot, including a very strong al allegiance to each other. So the moment you really start hitting Syria hard and the regime hard, you're hitting Iran in, in some ways. So this is a very complicated issue, but basically what the Western democracies are saying is that this has to stop, the slaughter has to stop, and I think, frankly, they're hoping that the people of Syria will be able to overthrow their own government and then perhaps the West can help out with democratic elections from there. Chris, I'm sure we'll be talking about this much more in the future. Thank you for your time this morning. You're welcome. That was Chris Sims reporting live from Ottawa. And for more on this and Syria's bid for a seat on the UN Human Rights Council, Musab Azawi joins us from, from the UK. He's the chairman of the Syrian Network for Human Rights and he's live via Skype from London, England. Azawi. Hello, hello, Alex. How well, are you today? I'm fine, thank you. So, uh, Musab, how, when we're talking about this, I don't know if you heard what, what we were just talking about. In a situation like this, do sanctions actually work? Well, basically, if you go back to that history of sanctions over Iraq, which lasted more than 11 years, 
nothing uh, could affect the regime then because these regimes are built on uh, uh, families and uh, the security forces. And technically, sanctions will not affect them because they will be able to find loopholes in these sanctions and compensate for that. We think that the only solution now to help the Syrians to free themselves is to uh, get a buffer zone with the borders with Turkey to help those people who are uh, longing to the right moment when they are able to desert the army, but they are afraid where we will leave our families because they have families and all the families of all the uh, deserters have been affected uh, heavily by uh, the interference of the security forces and the mercenaries led by them. So I think that sanctions would not be effective at all, but buffer zone would be dramatically changing the situation on the ground. So what we're looking at as the main solution in this situation is a crack in the Assad regime. Well, basically, uh, basically uh, now the regime is just based on the, the biggest axis, maybe uh, the, the only remaining axis of the regime, which is the army. And they are using the army heavily uh, to destroy all the infrastructure and uh, practice collective punishment for all the cities participating in the uprising. But given that 80% of the army are conscriptors, they are ordinary people, they are not trained to be professional soldiers, and they are just trying, they are hardly uh, trying and sending messages to ourselves, for example, asking, are you able to help us to desert the army? If there would be a chance for them to uh, protect their families, yes, the, the axis of the regime will start to fall apart, and definitely, definitely the regime, if we have a buffer zone, the life of the regime would be days, not weeks, definitely. So we're, we've heard plenty about the crimes that are committed by the Assad regime on a daily basis. Tell us a little bit about what the other side is doing. We're hearing about al-Qaeda coming in there. We're hearing about massacres from the other side as well. This is a war. You're going to get it on both sides. Are, are, does that worry you as well? Well, basically, uh, uh, we need to try to make it clear that all, all the people who led the uprising from day one, they are highly educated people, highly professional people. They are uh, longing for uh, freedom and dignity. This news about al-Qaeda interference, we cannot confirm that because these still are assumptions. And also, on the other hand, all the revolutionary bodies on the ground declared clearly that we condemn all the practices by the fundamentalists and we don't want them to step in into our country. And this statement has been said by the Syrian Revolution General Commission very clearly and all the revolutionary councils. But on the other hand, this is very normal when you leave a country with that complexity of geopolitical position to strive alone against that tyrant of Syria, it would be very easy to have fundamentalism to grow up. The, the easiest way is to help them in the early days, not to leave that uh, 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 situation to deteriorate more. I can say that the situation is dragged gradually to an open civil war, but unfortunately, if there would be a civil war in Syria, we would be definitely seeing al-Qaeda interfering and all the players from the international uh, uh, stage. So we think that so far it's, it's very limited, but we are afraid that would be very, very uh, big in the future if it's left alone. Okay, very quickly now, we don't have much time left. I'm going to ask you one more question. I've spoken to people from the former Yugoslavia, from Iraq, that have been, were under the, the reign of a dictator at one point or another, that say, you know what, those were the better days. We were different people from different groups, and, and, but at least we lived in peace. What do you think the people of Syria are going to be saying five years from now? Well, uh, basically, I think that there would be nothing worse than the life they lived under that uh, uh, regime when there is no freedom of speech. You can, you can lose your life if you just express your minor feelings when uh, more than 100,000 people have been lost in the country, when more than uh, 50,000 people were just arrested for just their opinions. I don't think that they will have anything worse 
than that. And I think that they have to take uh, the further mile and try uh, to build up uh, their democracy as the other nations uh, did in the other parts of the world. Which so, with so much sectarian within one, uh, sectarianism, I should say, within one nation, do you think that there will be a point of reconciliation sooner than later? Well, uh, basically, if you look about the architecture of the people who are leading the uprising, you will be amazed that they are a mixture of all uh, the ethnic and religious uh, 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 like complexities in the country. Uh, this, is, this is just, um, uh, in my opinion, it may have some roots, but this is uh, heavily propaganda by the regime to say that we are just fighting uh, Sunni Muslims. I don't think that this is true. For example, in our group, it's a human rights activist group. We have we have many more than 21 from Christians. Our team leader is a Christian in in Syria. We have many many Alawites working for us. I think that uh, it's a possibility because we have a lot of highly educated people, and they learned the lesson of other uh, how democracy can be built, and the lessons are present in in possibly in Libya, possibly in potential in Tunisia and Egypt. So we think that. They have to do that, and I think they are capable of that. Musab, of course, we wish all the best for the Syrian people, and thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure, Alex. That's Chairman of the Syrian Network for Human Rights, Musab Azawi. He was joining us live from Skype, or via Skype, I should say, from London, England. And that topic leads to yesterday's web poll. Three percent of you were said that you were surprised by Syria and how it's poised to win a seat on the UN Human Rights Council. 21% of you said you, hey, you weren't that surprised. The majority, that 76%, said it's business as usual at the United Nations.